Good afternoon, everyone. How are we doing? Fantastic. Ooh, okay. How are we, how are we really doing? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, being here this afternoon. Thank you to Horizons um, for another amazing conference. Um, yes, so my name is Hanifa Naya Washington, and I've had the pleasure and joy um, in 2019 of meeting Joshua Seth White um, at Burning Man. It was my first Burning Man, and I did not know how significant of an event that was going to be for me. Um, in the following year, the summer of 2020, um, at the height of the pandemic and a lot of turbulence in the country, I got a call from Josh and he says, I have this idea and I'd love your support. We went on to organize, to think about this passionate idea of what it would be to have a psychedelic peer support line, a national line that would support people in the midst of psychedelic experiences and any time after they've had a psychedelic experience? And what if that was free? And what if it was confidential? And what if all you needed was a phone to press a button and have a passionate volunteer on the other end of that line to be able to hold space for you as you processed, as you unraveled, as you unfolded, as you discovered? Holding that space in, in non-judgment and in care. We were able to find many, many people who thought this was a good idea. Uh, and when we launched the line on April 14th, 2021, we started with 25 volunteers. Um, and in that first year, we reached over two, um, 200 and uh, 2,000, 2,500 people in the first year. I'm stumbling with the numbers because I'm constantly tracking them. And to date now, we've, re we've served over 5,500 people. And I think it's important to note that as I am representing Fireside Project here in this conversation, I'm also representing um, the life of nonprofits, the life of, a start of starting up a nonprofit and what that's like, particularly in this field that um, is very much moving toward you know, commercial and for-profit endeavors. And I think it's important to understand that when, you're, when we started this nonprofit, for example, um, that first year, we did this from, with no support financially, holding that burden ourselves, uh, reaching out to small circles of friends and family for support initially, um, covering the costs of what it was needed to cover the infrastructure and um, the capacity building for the organization. And then you begin that long, slow dance of philanthropic fundraising. And it is a slow dance because it requires relationship building, it requires time. And so we said yes, we said yes to every interview, we said yes to every conference. Uh, we said yes to any opportunity to get out in front of people to say, we are here. We are offering a revolutionary service, and it's worth funding. You never know who's watching, who will be impacted, who will say yes. Um, but you kind of have a feeling as you're funding, fundraising that many people will say no. Um, and that's true. And then you just try to keep dancing and not step on anyone's toes. Um, until maybe they come around. So after many, many conversations and emails, um, follow-ups, um, many sleepless nights, um, we were in our, in our first year from hundreds of individual donations as well as some keystone contributions able to raise over the past two years 1.5 to be able to support this project. Yeah, that is worth talking for. <laughs> I can't, because I don't have time, because I have two minutes and 27 seconds left. I don't have time to shout out all of the people, but I will say, if you are in this room, and you are somebody who said yes to us, and you didn't know what was going to happen, because this has never happened before, there's never been a national psychedelic peer support line, we thank you. And I wanted to also, in this moment, just lift up one of our um, Keystone con contributors in the field, um, 
uh, Dr. Bronner's, in particular David Bronner, for really coming forward with our really first big contribution. And that was, I think, a signal to a lot of other um, ph philanthropists who said yes as well. So I just wanted to really to name that now. But the dance continues for us. Um, as we want to grow and develop and reach more people, we think in this year we are targeted to um, to support uh, about 7,500 people, or maybe even 10,000, if if we get there. But we know from our first year that the proof of concept works. People need this service. It was needed a long time ago, um, and so we will continue to dance to provide more support, to build our infrastructures for outreach to develop um, better technologies in which we're reaching people through, as well as continue to de develop our very robust um, research um, components of the project. And so I um, would invite you, if you want a tango, we, we would love to dance with you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Lindsay Hoover. Lindsay Hoover is a managing partner of JLS Fund, a SciTech venture fund investing at the intersection of neuroscience, technology, and entheogens to drive lasting impact in mental health. JLS invests in drug development and delivery, enabling technologies and ancillary products and services. Lindsay is also the co-founder of Immersive Worlds, an immersive experience well-being platform. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so we were asked to talk about funding challenges and experiences. I would say it's a perfect storm, a metaphor that will continue through my brief discussion here. Um, why is it a perfect storm? Well, we're, this, this global mental health crisis that I think everyone is aware of has, has reached really unsustainable proportions in terms of not just economic cost, but human cost. And it's gotten to the point where we're actually looking for solutions, and there are some other broad secular trends that are enabling that. I think that's why one of the interesting things about being aware of the broader you know, financial markets and ecosystem is we're acutely aware of where payers are coming out in this situation, and we know that the largest insurers in the world are watching the space, funding the space, and funding trials. So that's part of the, the, the one of the good, good winds blowing at the back in this perfect storm. Um, the, other, the other reason that now is such an amazing time to tackle the global mental health crisis is technology. The broader technology trends, um, I'll go through just a few of them that are contributing to our ability to address it, are things like bioconvergence, which combines the sequencing tools for all of our omics, bioinformatics, um, so the quantified self writ mass, and AI analytics to really drive the development of more accurate, effective, personalized solutions that can really dramatically improve mental health, and we know that without mental health, there is no health. And in fact, the insurers are aware that the actual comorbidity and cotoxicity of, of me mental health problems with other problems really exponentially increases the cost and also the human cost. So um, it's an exciting time. Um, so we're, we feel we're very well positioned because we're really involved in both of these trends and we're investing in psychedelics as well as digital health, all kinds of different software and other solutions and wearable technology, et cetera. Um, but psychedelics are a really interesting catalyst because the reason that I think um, the healthcare world and the innovators, and Matt talked about innovation in, in technology and healthcare today from MAPS, the reason everyone's so excited is because in our experience, most of the psychiatrists, the neurosurgeons, the people that have been in the field for, for decades believe that this is going to be a game changer. So, so um, one of the other interesting developments in um, technology that's helping us is basically neuromorphic computing. So we're, we're going to start to use the power of the brain to dramatically increase computing power, but I think through neurocomputing as well as neuromorphic computing as well as things like, um, you know, the, the brain interface kind of technology, we're also going to better understand how the brain works and how the connections can be rebuilt and extended, which should also lead to us using our brains to help heal our brains. Um, so, well, what are the challenges? Well, everyone knows we had a pretty big market correction last year, and there's a 
but all the markets sort of corrected in sync. So, so for the area that we're in, it's, it's actually good that it didn't self-correct alone because that wouldn't have been as good of a sign. And if you look at biotech in general, it's still on a pretty nice growth path if you take out the anomalous, spectacular 2021 numbers. So, so the long-term trends are, are positive. And um, when you have the public markets underperforming or not, not being as safe of a haven with as much risk as private markets, you see investors tend to look at the private markets because returns tend to be better there and uh, over the longer term. And so we actually think this is an excellent time for investors to be looking at this space. And the, the main challenge we have there is just lack of awareness. Again, going to Matt's talk, there's a lot of people that sort of know that something's going on on this side of the room, and it's just a matter of making them aware that actually the time has, has come for us to dramatically impact um, you know, mental health solutions. So um, the other interesting thing about um, where we are in the psychedelic drug development side is when you think about it from a risk perspective, biotech is a high risk, high reward investing game. And the fact that most of these substances are already known to work actually dramatically mitigates the risk of investing. So if you invest in psychedelics versus other kinds of drugs, you really already know to some degree that they're effective, which I think is a, is a dramatic difference um, distinguishing this field. So um, our, our I guess our biggest challenge is really just time and awareness, but we do feel really excited because there's, a, getting back to the perfect storm metaphor, there's, a, a, there's really a, a tsunami of passion around everybody that works in this field, and it's really energizing, and I think all of us feel like we're, we're doing the, uh, you know, the, the, we're having the most fun, doing the most good, and enjoying it more than anything we've ever done. And my partners and I, Simeon's here, we, we, we love being in the eye of the hurricane. And this is being in the eye of the hurricane during a perfect storm. So congratulations to everybody here. We're going to have a good time. Thank you, Lindsay. Our next panelist is Dick Simon. Dick Simon is the co-founder and CEO of Sensorium Therapeutics, a drug discovery company which is translating insights from nature to develop novel FDA-approved medicines that address various mental health conditions. He is a serial entrepreneur and leader in advancing psychedelic assisted therapies. He is the chairman of the advisory council of the Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics at Massachusetts General Hospital, co-founder and board member of the Boston Psychedelic Research Group, and is on the steering committee for the Psychedelic Science Funders Collaborative. Dick's work has earned him multiple awards, such as the YPO's Global Humanitarian Award, Harvard Business School's Making a Difference Award, as well as inclusion in Real Leaders Magazine's 100 Visionary Leaders and in the 100 Most Influential People in Psychedelics. Welcome. Great, thanks so much. See if we can make this. Okay. Th thanks so much. Um, so as context, we raised a $20 million Series A in September and are completing an additional $2 million oversubscription allowance this month. Uh, what I'd like <laughs> thank you. Um, so in terms of background, I've been a serial entrepreneur involved in a number of different areas, became very, very passionate about seven years ago and the potential of psychedelics to deal with mental health issues. And we, we deal with some mental health issues in my family and I was incredibly well aware of the desperate need for better tools and better treatments. One of the activities I got involved in, with is at, is at Mass General Hospital, uh, which is Harvard Medical School's primary teaching hospital, creating that center there, the Center for the Neuroscience of Psychedelics. Coming out of that, one of the scientists had this brilliant idea Everyone is focused on a dozen or so psychedelic, uh, classic psychedelics uh, and variants thereof. What if we looked at the massive white space adjacent to that, psychoactive plants and fungi that have been used for millennia in some situations, and reverse engineered how they work, developed synth synthesized products that are dramatic enhancement of those that can then be used for, for patients. 
With that, uh, a year ago in the summer of 2021, we raised a $9 million seed, uh, and then we began the process of developing the company and, very importantly, uh, creating a Series A. That's when that perfect storm began to hit. Um, dramatic market shift, major public uh, uh, companies going down dramatically, um, and tremendous instability globally and uh, geopolitically as well as economically. So the challenge became, you know, we're a high, as a biotech company, we're a high risk but high return potential for, for investors. And as uh, markets become more skittish, the, the risk gets valued more highly, and notwithstanding the fact that with a company like Sensorium and others, you can have 10x or much greater returns, there is still tremendous risk because it's a biotech company. So that was one of the issues that we were, were facing. How do we de-risk that? Secondly, we're a bridge. For some, we weren't psychedelic enough. We're not looking for uh, subjective effects, and for others, we were too nature-oriented. And then we have programs or drugs that we are, will be bringing to market, the first one of which is about to enter IND enablement, um, as well as a platform. How do we assess these thousands of psychoactive plants and fungi in a way to determine what are the important ones that we ought to be advancing as, as therapeutics in an FDA-approved context? Into all of this, we, we identified a phenomenal lead, Sante Ventures, which is a Austin-based billion-dollar life sciences investment fund. They have tremendous experience with computational platforms, which are really important to what we're doing as a way of distilling down all of this information that we're garnering. And their founder and chief investment officer is going to be joining us, uh, has joined now, Sensorium's board of directors. They hadn't invested in psychedelics, but we, to a certain degree, serve as a bridge in that space. We're working with psychoactive molecules, but not the classic psychedelics. Uh, we were joined in both the seed and Series A by many of the leading psychedelic-oriented uh, venture funds, Palo Santo, Eater, WPSS, Akama, Remind, many people from the Bridge Builders Group, and Route 66. So why did we get funded in this crazy, difficult environment? We had a great idea and the opportunity to create a drug discovery company looking at things that others weren't looking at, um, at that white space. We've got super smart science-driven team, but, but how did we really get past this barrier? One of them was around mission. We are not technically a, a, an impact investment, if you will, but the only way we succeed is by alleviating suffering for large numbers of people. Um, so we're, we're super well aligned on, on that, both economic value and impact value. We took a very pragmatic approach to raising the money, agreeing to terms that uh, are very investor friendly. Um, we, we took a prag you know, pragmatic approach. Our goal was let's create a two-year runway so that we can advance um, and, and succeed as a company and ultimately be helping people. And to the extent that there was more dilution than might have been necessary a year ago, um, we, uh, as this works out, there's plenty in it for absolutely everybody involved and certainly uh, for our investors. We, we also de-risked the approach. Um, using a platform for drug discovery, as a, basically as a drug discovery engine, really de-risks what if this one drug doesn't work? Well, the way we're doing it, we will have partnered out and have a lot of potential um, solutions to, to problems that people are otherwise facing. Um, we've also de-risked a lot with our progress. Over the course of the raising money, ironically, since it took several months to get the round closed, uh, after a term sheet was signed, current investors or later investors were buying in at a many-month-old valuation with huge progress that had been made. The validation was really important from Sante and then from many of the uh, venture funds that I mentioned who are also joining us. Reputation and trust was really critical. Um, I've known a lot of the investors for a long time and in, in many contexts, and I, I love the comment from a few like, no, I've been doing due diligence on you for 5, 10, 20 years, whatever it may be. You know, uh, I'm, I'm satisfied on that. I want to understand what, what it is you're doing. And with our funds, so we raised this $20 million in September. Uh, we're completing this additional $2 million in the next month. 
And with these funds, we'll be advancing our program uh, into the clinic and continue the development of the platform from which other programs, as well as business development partnership opportunities, will be emerging. So in terms of key lessons that I want to make sure people walk away with, it takes a lot of tenacity. We got a lot of no's. Fortunately, we got a lot of yeses. Um, venture is the perfect place for longer term, riskier investments. Um, and I think what's really important is to what we're doing and what others are doing is to let the science help us understand where the opportunities are. And investors are really, generally really smart. If the science is demonstrating true value, true efficacy, um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of potential there, and it worked for us. And then, really importantly, is speak the language of the biotech venture capitalists, uh, if, if that's where you're looking to raise money. Um, and so with that, um, I thank you all, and uh, happy to answer questions. It's my pleasure to introduce our final panelist, Greg Mays. Greg Mays, Reunion's President and Chief Executive Officer, has over 20 years of pharmaceutical drug development experience, most recently as President and CEO of Antios Therapeutics. Prior to Antios, Mays founded Engage Therapeutics and served as the company's President and CEO. Mays led Engage through successful phase 2B efficacy studies of the first and only drug device combination for rapid termination of an active epileptic seizure, which led to the company's acquisition by UB UCB. He also played integral roles in leading fundraising, partnering, and acquisitions as at Advaxis Immunotherapies as COO and at Immoclone Systems Corporations as Vice President, General Counsel, and Chief Compliance Officer. Welcome, Greg Mays. Thank you, and as uh, Lindsay mentioned, we were asked to uh, address just as, uh, a few opening remarks on our experiences with fundraising and uh, are the challenges that are posed for all of us because it's what propels us and allows us to do the great things that we're doing in the psychedelic and mental health space. Um, I actually like fundraising, and uh, I've enjoyed it um, over the years, and would like to think I've been uh, successful in it, ha having raised uh, close to a half a billion dollars over the last five or six years in various uh, biotech ventures. But the common denominator and what I think has separated and propelled me into being successful, and I think it really speaks to the heart of why many of you are here today, is passion. Uh, with, um, with, if we're passionate about what we're doing, um, we can overcome the, the challenges of fundraising in this environment and be successful. And it's what drove me uh, in my first adventure uh, in biotech uh, fundraising, which occurred in 2017. And I just thought I'd just share a couple quick highlights, because I think while it's not technically in the psychedelic space, there are some adjacencies and some lessons learned. So in 2017, I started uh, an epilepsy company, single person, walking the streets of New York. And why did I do it? Because my oldest son uh, has obsons epilepsy and was having uh, uncontrolled seizures and was being treated down the road here at NYU. And because I was in biotech and because I thought I had something to give, I started to work with the NYU researchers on some of their epilepsy projects. We identified a new and novel rapid epileptic seizure termination inhaler, and I was passionate about it. I saw how it worked in 10 patients, and it worked. It stopped seizures in 30 seconds. There was nothing that could uh, stop it and uh, stop seizures that quickly when they were um, coming, on, coming on board. So um, that's, that's what drove me to get out and raise a $40 million uh, Series A. I think it starts with mentors and support. So if you are a mentor in this audience, thank you. Um, I had dinner Monday night with my mentor, whose daughter um, also has uh, uncontrolled epilepsy um, in the Boston area. And he was the first person I called. I said, how can I be successful here? And he said, I said, do you think this is the right idea? And he said, yes. So mentors and physicians support the, the uh, epileptologists and neurologists at NYU really propelled me, propelled me forward. 
You got to have grit. I think that's already been mentioned um, on this on the stage here today. Um, we called on over 180 investors. We knocked on so many doors. But the reason I was able to do it is, again, because I was passionate. I wanted to find a way forward for um, my son and the three million people in the United States that have um, uncontrolled uh, epilepsy and are looking for a tool to stop their seizures once they know one is coming on board. It takes one person. Um, we found one investor, and that investor we took on very investor-friendly terms, as Dick mentioned earlier. I didn't care about valuation. I just wanted to get this project funded. And so I think too many times people are want a high valuation and they want to make lots of money, and that takes over. But when you're passionate about the end game, you don't care. And that's not what's going to, that, that, you know, you, 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 you will get behind that. Nobody's going to remember that you were given a $5 million um, valuation. So take the investor-friendly terms. So we got the money. We got $40 million. We nailed a phase two study because we were passionate about it. I, the same doors I knocked on for investors or became investigators at comprehensive epilepsy centers all across the country, begging them to enroll up to 160 patients in a phase 2B study that turned out to be wildly positive and resulted in the transaction of our business to a major epilepsy company, UCB. How did I come to psychedelics? Well, psychedelics, uh, there is a, uh, a major adjacency to epilepsy, believe it or not. Epilepsy, the largest comorbidity associated with epilepsy is depression and anxiety of which my son also suffers from, and so do the uh, millions of people with epilepsy out there. So I'm excited about taking on a new fundraising challenge in the world of psychedelics. Um, as has already been mentioned on, on stage, I, and I, expe I expect to bring it forward uh, into the epilepsy space. I'm a very big critic in the patient advocacy circles of epilepsy today in saying uh, we care too much about seizure management and not about the mental health um, of our patients. Um, I'm excited about psychedelics because I do believe they work. I think they're safe. I think the FDA and DEA are going to let psychedelics move forward, and we're learning about that more and more um, each day. And the extent we can differentiate ourselves from the past and, and, and mechanisms of action that did not work, um, the better we will be. My advice is to let your passion drive your fundraising and simplify your story. So for example, with my current psychedelic adventure at at Reunion Neuroscience, we are being very simple. Investors have a very sort of short span of attention, and we are saying we are going to deliver phase one data, we are going to open up an investigational new drug application, and we are going to move our psychedelic product into postpartum depression. Just three simple things that they can bite off and chew. So again, bring your passion, make it simple, and be prepared to have a lot of grit. And if you allow your passion to, to drive what you're working on, I think it could help. I look forward to answering questions on the panel. And of course, if you can catch me in the hallways afterwards, I'd be happy to mentor you on fundraising. I spend at least two or three calls a week just helping people figure out how to raise money for their important ventures, because they're all important to me and the patients that they serve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg. Just a reminder, everyone, submit your questions through the QR code on the back of your badge for anyone who's just joining for the afternoon. That's how they get to me, to the iPad. And I'd like to kick it off with Hanifa. Can you walk us a little bit through what the journey looked like for you? Who were the donors that you were targeting? Who did you ultimately persuade? And what were their priorities? Sure. I think that for us, again, um, in the beginning, it really was about um, the folks who were closest to us, the connections we already had, including friends and family. Um, and then looking at, um, because we are technically a um, fiscally sponsored project, we, we've applied for our 501, there are certain um, donors who are okay with that, and there, we learned that there are some certain donors who are not, and so there are certain folks who, in terms of foundations that we could approach for um, grants um, and donations, and some wouldn't 
uh, don't, just don't allow or don't give to folks who don't have their own 501. So, um, but fiscally being fiscally sponsored is huge and has allowed us to actually fundraise. And so um, shout out to the Social Good Fund um, whose their entire work is about supporting and incubating um, uh, amazing ideas. And so um, some of the, the, again, one of the larger sort of capital um, donations that we received from uh, Dr. Bronner's um, was amazing because they also were able to reach out to other uh, philanthropists in the space who they know were already giving, and we pulled together a small private um, online um, donor gathering or potential donor gathering, and we were able to present our, our case and to talk about what our ideas were, what our passions were, and what the trajectory of, of the project was, and from that, um, from that event, things just began to spread out. And so, again, the process is about building those relationships. So that night, um, it was, we were sort of surprised because we didn't walk away. People weren't pulling out their checkbooks and, and, and writing checks immediately. But it turned out from that initial fundraising that we had that we were able to, to, to bring on another five or six donors directly from that group. And then from that group, they told other um, you know, private, private donors. Um, and we were able to also seek some funds from smaller uh, family foundations as well and some smaller grants. And for us, um, it's about uh, continuing to lay the track as we go. Um, but also a lot of uh, donors in nonprofits, uh, philanthropists, they want to see how you operate and are you successful? Do you do what you say you're going to do? So they'll give a small amount um, and then circle back to you in, in a year or six months and then you can see if there's potential to ask for more funding in this way. Um, and that is happening as well. So I think, you know, we're so new as well, you know, um, less, than, less than two years. Um, and we have, have gotten a lot of attention in, in, the, in the direct community, but um, we're also looking to foundations who are in the psychedelic space, who, are, who haven't given to, to, to um, this field yet. And I, I think as um, an organization that is based in harm reduction in community, that we have a greater opportunity to hedge um, some kind of like turn uh, some foundations to be able to give to uh, a nonprofit cause. Great, thank you for that. Lindsay, what about you? What are you hearing from the different types of investors that you're raising money from, LPs and other categories? Like, where's the biggest appetite? What kind of business models do you really see the most investor interest from? I'm sorry, was that question for me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, where, where are we seeing most of the appetite yeah. for investment? Yeah. And well, what in general, what are you hearing from from the LPs and the well, other we're 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 sort of fortunate in that a good number of our investors are professional investors. So they're venture capitalists, they're private equity guys, mostly guys, but still. Um, and they, uh, many of them were direct investing, and they realized that this is really, you know, a science-heavy. Uh, analytical, deep dive diligence kind of a thing that we're doing here. Um, some other areas are probably easier for professional investors to go into. And so they recognize that if they really want to make great returns here, and we do have double digit positive returns on paper, yay, after a very tough year, I think that they look at us and see us as, in some cases, their bridge to the space. Um, and the, the also the word is sort of out that this perfect storm is the next big thing. Mm -hmm. So alpha seeking investors know about this and we, we feel flattered that, that they've chosen us to be sort of their emissaries. There's also a, a large group of family offices and we've talked about passion and mission. And I think the passion and the mission of, of many growing family offices is, is to put their money where their where their passion is around mental health. So I completely agree with everyone on the panel that, and I, you can tell how passionate we all are. It's, it's an exciting place to be and that comes through. Um, I think the other reason that we are um, successful in fundraising is we are very, I don't want to say that the term I gave myself last night, Dick said I shouldn't call myself that, so I won't say it again, but we're very, very serious about due diligence. You know, biotech, I, I actually was interesting, I was at another more general investing conference earlier this year, and I was taken by how 
it's really kind of a swashbuckling, almost reminds me of real estate investing. You really do have to sell the dream because there is so much risk, but our job is to distill that risk. Yep. And I'd say the re another reason that we're fortunate is we are more broadly investing in the ecosystem, so technology, not just around psychedelics, but around advancing mental health. Um, and, and, that, and being able to invest in software and wearables in digital therapeutics changes the, the risk profile of a portfolio so that you're going to have some exits earlier. They're less capital intensive than drug development. We were also in some of the very best drug development deals very early, so we were very price conscious. So I think it's just sober investing and people are very, very excited about psychedelics and even the professional investors, most of them are in this, even though they're seeking alpha, they're in this because they really want to see change in mental health and they really believe in it. And the next new wave of investors we're seeing are doctors, psychiatrists, doctors, al almost every doctor. My husband went to the dermatologist yesterday and started talking about this to his dermatologist. He's like, I've been hearing about that. I want to I hear more about it. So as the word gets out in the medical community, um, I think that I agree with you that, you know, the DEA and the FDA, it's almost like, I like to say Schrodinger's cat's out of the bag. I mean, I don't think there's putting a cat, this cat back in the bag. Because what are you going to tell a mom who, or, or a senator whose child is suffering from addiction that they can't have this? I just don't think it's going to fly. So, exciting times. And <laughs> applause is always welcome. <laughs> Dick, you mentioned that you're the first psychedelic investment for your lead investor. How did that impact the fundraising process? So, um, it's interesting. It, it had impact in a lot of different ways. Uh, for psychedelic funds, um, they fully understood what we were doing. Um, and in that context, I think the way we are approaching it is so science first. Uh, was very reassuring and, and yes, there's deep diligence that, that is done in that process and, and I think we kept, you know, we've got some of the top founders from, from Harvard and MGH, uh, neuroscience and psychiatry and, and medical chemi medicinal chemistry. For uh, our lead, which is not familiar with this space, I think they are looking at us as a CNS drug development company. Um, the fact that it happens to be psychoactive, nature-inspired molecules is nice, but, but it was not critical. It was more the overall approach that they really liked. The, the use of um, sophisticated assays, use of human neuronal cells, and then ultimately having all of this information that needs to be distilled down and using machine learning to do that with, with graph technology. So I, I think that... Um, in that situation, it was that we were a really attractive CNS mental health drug discovery company that happened to be in this space. Uh, in, in a lot of what I've done, it's been about bridging, and, and ironically, um, in this space, uh, I, I've been able to, to be doing that, uh, not necessarily intentionally, but you know, bringing traditional, large, major biotech venture funds that do deep, deep, deep diligence. Um, and, and you actually learn, we actually learned a lot through that diligence, um, just great questions that, you know, some of which we had great answers to, and others of which helped direct the way that we were looking at things. So, um, yeah, I, I would say that working with them uh, has been a, a real gift uh, through that process. We may be helping them in terms of going into different types of psychoactive spaces, uh, which is important, and they are certainly helping us in terms of doing a better job with a platform, doing a better job with drug discovery, and adding a lot of insight and wisdom across a lot of areas. I mean, psychedelics in this room, we may feel like it's a bubble, uh, but, it, but it's actually part of how do you address a mental health crisis, a central nervous system crisis, and in general, you know, health crises. Um, and approaching it that way, that kind of messaging, I think is what, what resonated with them and, and others, um, and it, it is what we're doing and how we're directing. Mm. Greg, I'm also curious to hear from you about this. You have a ton of experience fundraising in biotech. How is the psychedelic sector unique, and what are some of the challenges that you're anticipating as you're stepping into this new role? Yeah, so I've um, been a, a psychedelic CEO for two weeks yesterday, <laughs> and I've had a chance to uh, <laughs> talk to some, uh, just talk to some investors, and, and I think the good news for 
um, everybody here is that uh, there's, there's a lot of acceptance and interest. They're looking at me and my team and my company as a pure play biotech. Why? We're developing mental health medicines mm -hmm. and the label is, is less relevant. And I think there's a greater acceptance that psychedelics are working, um, will work, um, can be done safely, and, and the, as I mentioned earlier, I believe the, the, the government and, and regulators are coming on board. What I'm seeing and hearing are a couple things. One, um, you have investors that I think this is really exciting that are now recognizing the potential and that these are mainstream and that these will be medicines and they haven't placed their bet. So the good news for everybody in the audience is I think that there's a lot of money on the sidelines and a lot of interest out there um, for you as well. And I also think despite the fact that we're in the midst of uh, you know, definitely an equity markets downturn and it's been uh, the, my, the last serious amount of money I raised was in March of 2021. Um, $107 million in a Series B raise, and that was the height of the market. And we're still in this sort of malaise, slipping backwards. But what I'm hearing is, is that the opportunities or the interest by investors for Series A investments, which are a lot of people in this audience, as well as micro cap or underappreciated assets, um, is really strong. So, um, and that's where my, my current company sits, and I think the, uh, you know, the, the people are looking for, as has been mentioned, de-risk assets, so it's incumbent upon us to de-risk and, de and demystify psychedelics and really show their true value um, as a medicine. And I look at my company as a drug development company. That's why we were even formed to, to really be viewed as a, again, pure play biotech that's going to, in coordination with the FDA and other regulatory agencies around the world, put psychedelics through phase one, two, and three, and, and get them approved. And I think that that will also be very helpful for patient acceptability and is certainly necessary for um, payer support ultimately. So um, really, I'm actually really excited about it. I think um, there's, uh, there are people that haven't placed their bet and uh, the, the word isn't fully appreciated yet. So, and we all know that there's a, a, just a gigantic unmet medical need. Thank you. If we have a few questions from the audience for the founders surrounding what you're looking for in potential investors. Anyone who wants to speak to that? Sure. Um, well, again, we, we have raised, um, you know, the, the uh, round, the, the most of our Series A. Uh, we have this opportunity to take in an additional $2 million in oversubscription. And w I love working with people that can help teach me things that offer additional perspectives, uh, as well as passion and desire to, to stick in there for the long term rather than a very short term. But people who appreciate science, who have really good perspective um, on a, a range of different areas. So th that, that's what I would, you know, and obviously capital is helpful <laughs> when you're raising money, but, um, but, but it's, it's more than that. And a lot of our investors are bringing a lot more to the table and we're grateful for it. I mean, I'm looking for um, top healthcare-centric, sort of traditional healthcare investors because the name begets more investment. And so, I, uh, with my first epilepsy company, the minute I got TPG Capital to to lead the round of investment, it was like I couldn't stop answering the phone. So, to the extent you can get one really top healthcare quality investor, um, there's a lot of people who just follow investors into it, and. Um, that's, you know, I think you get a very highly ethical, legitimate top investor, and it's hard, it's not easy. You're gonna, you're gonna knock on a lot of doors and get a lot of doors put back in your face, but um, it, that can really become the cornerstone for success. Yeah, I would completely agree with you that the validation exactly. of, of a, a well-known and very credible lead is, is really helpful. Great, so it sounds like resilience is the key ingredient <laughs> for anyone in the room who is about to fundraise. And this concludes this panel. There are tons of questions, but we're out of time, unfortunately. So I'd like to give it up for Thank our you. panelists. Thank you. Thank you.